Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. Steve Cohen, the billionaire hedge funder and New York Mets owner in his first CNBC interview, part of his higher profile. I realized I enjoyed it. I had no idea. Cohen's two and a half billion dollar baseball purchase. You don't think about this as as philanthropic, do you? I do. You do. That's why I bought the team. I actually view it as a civic responsibility. And his other investments like golf and betting on AI's tailwinds. I don't see it as a bubble. I think the markets are discounting some of what they think AI is going to do for companies. Plus, Steve Cohen on his long, rocky road to being liked on Wall Street. I'm the same guy. It just shows you that the world keeps turning. Enjoy your life. And, you know, it's just amazing what can happen. That big interview today and an update on Disney's boardroom battle. This has been an unusual proxy battle in many, many ways. It is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand by, Joe, in three, two, one. His mic, here. Good morning and welcome to Squawk Box here on CNBC, live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Joe Kernan. Uh, Becky is, uh, Andrew, I think she's on a, a boat, actually, coming through the, uh, the, there's so much rain back here. I'm not sure it's necessarily an arc, uh, but she's, uh, no, she's here. She'll be out, but uh, it, it's been raining for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, basically. It's not, not over yet. You're in South Carolina. I, they have great weather uh, most of the time. Uh, it, it, what do you have coming up and how's the weather? Uh, so far, so good on the weather. You know, the last time we have uh, been here in Kiowa Island, actually, we've done this outside. We're doing it today inside uh, on the off chance, actually, that the weather gets a little bit worse uh, than it has been. Uh, we are at the annual Global Sports Leadership Conference that's put on uh, by uh, Bruin Capital and Sportico. A big exclusive interview, first time ever on CNBC. Steve Cohen is going to be with us now, of course, the Mets owner, uh, but maybe better known uh, to those on Wall Street as uh, the chairman and CEO of Point72. Uh, so many folks in the sports world here. We have uh, many of the commissioners uh, from all over the league. I think Michael Rubin is coming down. I saw A-Rod here uh, last night. Mark, uh, Mark Lohr, of course, who's involved with him uh, trying to buy the Timberwolves. Uh, you really just can't walk around this place without seeing somebody uh, who's in the middle of one of the big uh, major sports deals right now. And so we're going to be talking about all of that this morning yeah. from uh, he, was pro- he was probably hoping that the Mets would have won a game uh, at, at this point. But yep. Well, no we're going to talk about that. You no know, way they were um, pl- They were going to play yesterday. They say money they can't was- buy love. And money, <laughs> money can't buy love and money can't always buy winning. So There's we'll, no, way uh, we'll playing, uh, no way they were playing a home game yesterday. There's just no way, and it didn't happen. Um, but maybe we'll try again today. They're supposed to play the Tigers yesterday, uh, but that did not happen. 0-4, oh, but that's, it's early. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, Yankees are like 5-1 and one or something. They're telling me to move on. You believe that? The Dow and S&P fell for a second straight day, weighed down by uh, doubts that the Fed has inflation under control. And who knows now? It, people are actually saying it out loud. There may be no rate cuts this year. NASDAQ fell 1%, S&P 7 tenths. Uh, of a percent, the I'm, the Medicare uh, Medi- Medicare uh, stuff didn't help either with no, United Health. United yeah. Health and hurt all the other insurance. Which was a and Dow. The other thing I would say is, look, I, I had more concerns about this on Friday than I did based on Monday's numbers. Friday's data showed that the inflation was running hotter than expected. The revised previous inflations. Uh, numbers. It was the ISM. Yeah. The idea that manufacturing is strong and running. I mean, that's the best case scenario. If the Fed's not going to, re- to cut rates, it's doing it because there's a stronger economy. It's that's the part that you are happy to see. Strong economy, strong inflation, not so much. But treasuries and commodities uh, responding uh, in kind. Uh, treasuries now are we 440 yet? 436. And then, you know, oil, 85, gold, uh, long dormant uh, has been hitting some new highs for the past, uh, I guess, three or four months, uh, really. We talked to Katie Stockton about a month ago about the long saucer uh, that we saw in gold uh, and that it had uh, broken out. And it was one of those instances where she says she doesn't know what resistance is because it's never been here before. So you can't really talk about it. But uh, again, uh, gold up another $11, so closing in on uh, 2300 But there are inflation uh, concerns. 
Reuters is reporting that Disney has secured enough shareholder votes to defeat Nelson Peltz's try-in fund in a proxy battle. That report says enough votes had been cast as of last night to put Disney's board of directors safely ahead of try two challengers. Reuters sources did caution that there's always a possibility that some shareholders may change their vote. They're allowed to do that up through the meeting today. A separate Bloomberg report said Vanguard is backing Disney's slate of nominees. Vanguard is the largest investor in Disney with an 8.3 percent stake. That stock this morning down by about 19 cents. I don't know if you saw this, Becky, but, you know, Bill Ackman uh, tweeted out last night about this report, I believe. And I thought it was fascinating. He said there's been several of these reports saying that Disney is winning its proxy contest with Nelson Peltz. Um, he said that he doesn't have an investment in Disney. Uh, but he thought that it was useful, as he said, to point out the inappropriateness of what he said is the leaks to the press about this. He said only a company and its advisors have access to how shareholders have voted before the day of the annual meeting. My understanding is that it is illegal to release the outcome of the vote prior to being finalized as it has an effect of manipulating the outcome. We've talked about this in the context of political elections. Uh, here the company and its advisors, or somebody, uh, has leaked uh, that Disney is winning the contest. Uh, it says it's inappropriate uh, and they should not have done so, if in fact that's the case. I don't know who the sources are, but I say it because it's actually a, an interesting thing. It's very rare where we've seen a proxy contest uh, in recent years that I can recall where you had reports yeah. prior to the outcome half the vo half of the who's going to win. Yeah. They kept saying, you know, with, half the vo with about half the votes in, Disney's doing, that was really, it was weird, with only half. There's a lot of things that are weird about this proxy fight. Normally, companies don't get into the fray. They kind of play like they are above what the shareholders are doing or what the activists are doing. This has been a case where the company has taken activist tactics and turned it back on the activists, uh, which tells you one of a couple of things. Either they were concerned that they were going to lose or this was a situation where Bob Iger said, I, I just can't possibly stand the thought of, of dealing with Nelson Peltz on the board. I didn't come back out of retirement to deal with that. Uh, but this has been an unusual proxy battle in many, many ways. Cheese will be next. Coming up, Mets owner, billionaire, and Point 72 chairman and CEO Steve Cohen. In his first interview on CNBC ever, he talks the baseball season and all his sports investments, like golf. My belief is a four-day work week is coming. That should fit into a theme of more leisure for people, which means golf rounds will go up. And as an asset manager, he's eyeing the Fed, well, just like the rest of us. The Fed thinks they, you know, eventually is going to come down to 2% inflation rate. What do you think? I think that's going to be hard. That big interview right after this. Welcome back to Squawk Pod. I'm producer Katie Kramer. Our highlight interview today is with Steve Cohen. He's a billionaire, he's the new owner of the New York Mets, and he's the chairman and CEO of Point72, a global asset manager with about $32 billion under management. Billion, with a B. So, the $2.4 billion he spent buying that baseball team in Queens, no biggie. He's not thinking of it as an investment, per se, something he makes clear in today's discussion. Cohen is also invested in golf, putting money into the PGA and the New York team in the Tomorrow Golf League. The TGL was founded by two legends of the sport, Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy. This play for sports business has put Cohen squarely in the limelight, and historically, he's rarely done interviews. Today's conversation is his first on CNBC ever. But Cohen isn't a stranger to press. One of his former hedge funds paid a $1.8 billion fine in an insider trading scandal that involved eight of Cohen's portfolio managers. That was more than a decade ago, in 2013. He's since rebranded the fund as part of the Point72 firm, it's Point72 Asset Management. Cohen's firm has also faced a lawsuit and later a complaint over treatment of women in the workplace. Today, Cohen's mostly known as the billionaire owner of the Mets and an active poster on social media platform X during baseball season, of course. Steve Cohen joined our Andrew Ross Sorkin on site in Kiowa Island, South Carolina, today on our TV broadcast. It is great to have you Good on the program here, for the very yeah. first time. For the very first time. Hey, you know, you got to try everything once, right? You got to try so, everything once. Well, we'll see whether we, we, we get to do it more than once. Um, I want to talk to you about so many things. I want to talk to you about sports, the business of sports, owning this team now. Sure. And then I want to get into the markets and what you're thinking about uh, more broadly as well. But um, 
Right, we're going to start with actually the team this year, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. Uh, given, given, given the win streak or really the opposite in terms yes. of where we are. How you think about that as an owner, but how you think about that as a hedge fund manager? Well, I mean, we're only, it's only four games into the season, right? right? Be the equivalent of getting off to a bad start, let's say, in a hedge fund year. You have a, you have a couple down days early in January. You still got a lot of time left to, uh, you know, do what you normally do. And so, yeah, nobody wants to start zero and four. I mean, uh, but, you know, it's, it's early, right? And, you know, it, during the season, you're going to have losing streaks. We just happen to have one at the beginning. So w what is this like for you now? I mean, your whole life, I think, has fundamentally changed. You're now in the public eye in a way. Uh, in the that, public eye, yeah. That, that uh, you haven't been. Yeah. You've, you've, well, I should say, there's been a shift in the pub public eye, and now you're actually doing interviews and things yeah. uh, and being more public. How do you feel just about that? You know, I, it's something that um, I, I knew buying the Mets would be much more public. And, um, but I enjoy it. You know, like I, I realized I enjoyed it. I had no idea, right? When you sit behind screens for as long as I have, and you're kind of, you know, not necessarily, you know, have to do that type of stuff. And so I actually enjoy it. I actually enjoy interacting with the fans and doing the press conferences. And, and you, know, it's, it's, you know, it's just a stretch for me, you know, something different. And how much of being, of doing what you've done in business is similar or different to this in terms of the analytics, uh, the way you think about, I mean, you trade stocks. Yes. Uh, you yeah. own a team, you trade players. Right. Is, it, is it similar or totally different? Yeah, I mean, it's different. I mean, you know, people think that I'm, make, I'm not making the decisions. I mean, my baseball people are making the decisions. My job is to, you know, when, when they, they need me to support their decision, you know, they come to me and say, this is what I want to do. I've never said no to anything. And so, I mean, we have discussions and, and we talk about it. But I'm not, I'm not making, you know, those ideas are not coming from me, and which is totally different than running my hedge fund. My hedge fund, I'm much more involved. Um, right. But, you know, frankly, in, in my hedge fund also, I, we, we have 200 portfolio managers. I'm not telling them what to do either. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I give them the risk limits and things like that. And I'm always available if they need to discuss anything. So I'm used to operating in a very decentralized way, and I give people a lot of rope. Um there's big questions about baseball, both the valuations of these teams. You spent uh, a, a, a lot of money on yours and also yeah. how much money these teams spend on a given year yeah. uh, for players, the different markets, big markets, small markets. Yes. What do you think of the system right now in terms of what's happened yeah. in baseball? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're in one of those moments in baseball where people are thinking about, OK, what do we like about the system, what we don't? You've got 30 owners, you've got 30 different opinions. And so, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, there's no doubt that smaller market clubs aren't crazy about large market clubs spending a lot of money. Um, all within, you know, we're all right. operating within the rules that baseball sets out. Do you, does, does, mon does money buy winning? I mean, people say money buys, clearly, does, doesn't buy love. Clearly not, okay, right. okay, because we tried that. I mean, the real problem is if, if you're trying to build a team through free agency, that's such a tough place to be because you're fighting the aging curve. You're buying players based on their previous history, but they're getting older. Right. As they get older, performance over time declines. And so it's a tough place to be. So what you really want to do is develop talent, which is no different than what I do in my hedge fund. Okay, and, that, and that's the similarities between right. the two. Okay, but yeah. you have been famous for cutting your losses in, in the hedge fund world, Yeah, famously. If, yeah. if things are not going well, you, yeah. you cut your losses. Can you do that in baseball? Well, I kind of did it last year, right? right? You kind of did. did. That's kinda where I was going. That's, oh, where, that's where the oh, question okay. was going. Yeah, so you're, le you're leading me to, the, uh, to that question. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I looked at it and realized that the team was probably not going to make the playoffs. And even if it did, it probably wasn't going to get very far in the playoffs. And so it was a, it was a just, I think at that point we had a 15% chance of making the playoffs. A lot of teams in front of us. It would have been hard to pull off. And, and so... You know, we had contracts that were, you know, I felt it wasn't going right. to change in, 20, in 23. In 24, it probably wouldn't get any better. So, I, you know, I did, I did a complete pivot. Right. And I think I shocked baseball in the extent that I did it. Uh, but for me, it's just natural because, you know, I looked and said, okay, I, I, don't, like the, I don't like the positions I have. Right. And so I wanted to make a change. Uh, you want a ring. How, much, how, how many years yeah. do you think it will take you to get there, how much will it cost? Well, the, 
the co I don't care about the cost side. I mean, I think over time, my... But do you, think, you no, don't no, think about no, this no, as, as no, philanthropic, the, do you? I do. You do? That's why I bought the team, okay? Well, that's exactly why I bought the team. And, and you know, I, I said, and I said in my original press conference, if I can make millions of people happy, how cool is that? And so I actually view it as a civic responsibility. And, and uh, now, listen, nobody wants to lose money forever and spend money and not, not have success. And, I, and to me, I, I deem success as not only winning the World Series, getting in the playoffs and winning the World Series. It's also developing an, uh, like a deep farm system that creates, creates talent over, you know, over the years, right. over and over again. So on the, but on the economic piece of it, though, yeah. what I was going to ask you is, the valuations of these teams. Yeah. Where do they go in a world? We were talking about Jimmy Pateros here from uh, from ESPN. We're all wondering what's happened to linear television. Right. Um, I know you can't talk about individual right. stocks. We were talking earlier in the week no. about how, yeah. how your company yeah. had, had uh, or some of your PMs had clearly uh, bought bought Fox. Yeah. What do you think happens to the media landscape, if you will? And this is sort of an investment question. Yeah. As it relates to whatever happens to that, impacting the valuation of sports teams like your own? Well, you would think that um, valuations are tied into profitability, right? Or some, some metric. And, you know, right now, because of what's going on in the cable industry and, and, and media in general, um, you know, revenues for teams are probably going to go down over the short term as we figure out what the new model is. It's clearly going to be streaming, but the question is, is it going to be right. bundled with, you know, other, other, we're all, baseball, all sports are trying to figure it out. And, and um, you know, some, some sports are better off than others. NFL does a national package, right? right? And that most of the revenues come from, from that. In baseball, you know, some uh, revenues for teams are local revenues. And so, and so that's a problem, right. right? Because now revenues are going down. Now, when you look at the appreciation of, of let's take baseball. Baseball is only appreciated teams, uh, I think like 6% a year since, you know, the early 2000s. I don't think that's extraordinary returns. And so um, when you think about it, you could probably have done better in an index fund. Let me ask you this, though. Uh, one, of the, one of the pieces uh, or component parts is the future of betting in the business, real estate. One of the things that uh, yeah. is in play with uh, City Field yes. uh, is this idea that you might be able to build a, a 50-acre, both, both park and yeah. mall and all sorts of Not things. Not a mall. And Not a, a mall. And Not a casino. A okay. And a casino. Yeah, we call it an entertainment complex, music, casino, gaming, uh, 1,500 hotel rooms, 25-acre park. We're going to build a separate uh, area where fans can go and go to, right. have, go to restaurants. What's and, it going to yeah. take to get that approved in New York? How, how, how much has to be yeah. given by the taxpayers? Yeah. Taxpayers don't want to pay for it. I, I totally get that. We are financing it privately. It's going to be an eight billion dollar project. Um, you know, and you think you have to get nothing from the from the city? I mean, you know, I, I'm not as steeped in the weeds on, but generally, I would say the vast, vast majority of the money is coming from private sources. Me and, and my partner. Right. And the casino piece, the betting piece. How yes. important is that? Well, that's the economic engine. Right. You can't spend eight billion dollars and have a bunch of restaurants. That's not going to work. Right. Okay, so you need you need an economic engine, and and that's it. And you know that's right. and if it you know that's that that's going to provide all the right. other great as stuff. As a guy yeah. in the markets, how yeah. do you feel about betting as it relates to sports? I mean, the yeah. reason I ask is Otani's in the news, right? Everybody yes. saying what's yeah. what, you know what happened. Right. Yeah. Um, I, by the way, I'm curious what yeah. you think happened there. But I, I have no idea, but I, I'm going to trust him. You're going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. Yeah. Because I, I because he just seems like someone that is so focused on his stuff that I could see how... You but know, do you think that the league but, just has to figure out, I mean, given, given the sort of superstar status that yeah, he has, they, they, yeah. they can't let this... Well, they have to investigate, and they will, okay? I mean, and, and you know, they're good at that type of stuff, and then they'll get to the bottom of it. Um, separately, and we're here at a big sports conference, you've invested in golf. Yes. Uh, in yeah. a big way. That's right. Uh, yeah. You're partner now with Fenway as well as part of that. That's right. What is your, your, yeah. your thesis on golf, and, and yeah. what do you think is going to happen with, with Liv as well yeah. um, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of PIF and, yeah. and the Saudis? Yeah, I mean, you know, we think it's a, an interesting investment. It's a global sport. Um, rounds are going up on a yearly basis. Um, you know, and so we, we think uh, the way it's been run, we think we can improve the operations, improve and, and, and make it much more pro profitable. Um, 
I love golf. Okay, I mean, you know, you're a golfer. You brought, I'm a golfer. You, I brought you, my clubs here. You brought your clubs here. Right? Okay. I'm going to be on the range later today. The um, wind is not yeah. good. That's Just, okay. You, know, you can blame yeah. the wind. You know, some it's an outdoor sport, right? right? Same thing at baseball. Sometimes the wind blows, and and um, yeah. So we think it's a a really interesting investment. Obviously, you know, golf's at a moment where there's a lot of stuff going on that needs to be worked out. Uh, but we think we can work it out, and, and we're excited to get involved and, and help the sport grow. You have a thesis, I'm told, that mm -hmm. you actually shared uh, with Yasser from PIF. That's right. Yeah. Uh, about yeah. the work week. We always talk about sort of working from home, working yeah. from uh, the office, that you think is actually behind part of your investment in golf and actually may be your, behind your investment in or thoughts about how the whole yeah. economy changes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, would, I think I would have done the golf investment anyway, because I think there's a longer term thought. But I, in What's my, the thought? My belief is a four day work week, work week is coming. Um, you know, it just, it, between the advent of AI, um, you know, generally, I just, it, 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 you know, we, we hear from people that Fridays are just not, uh, people are not as productive on Fridays. And so I just think it's an eventuality. When it happens, hard to know. But that should fit into a theme of more leisure for people, uh, which means golf rounds will go up. And, so people are going to play know, more and golf on Fridays. And interest will go up. And so, yeah, I guess courses will be crowded so what on are the, What are yeah. the other investment yeah. ideas then around that idea? Well, anything around, you know, I would say leisure, travel, right? right? Experiences, all that type of stuff, right? I mean, I, that, that makes, you know, if people have more time, they're going to... And are you, yeah. oh, but you don't anticipate letting your traders and PMs not work well, on, the market's frankly, up. on Saturday, they're working you these guys. You know something, if, if, they're, if they're taking off Friday and they have a, a portfolio, that's a problem, okay, if the markets are open. So forget, forgetting us, okay, I mean, the vast majority of, of people will get an opportunity, I think, at some point to have a three-day weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd asked you earlier how it feels to sort of shift into this more public role. But I am curious uh, how it feels to be, you are now a beloved uh, yeah. person in New York. Maybe, and okay, I'm still, we haven't won. We'll, we'll see okay. if you win. Okay, we'll but see that's how long been that a real, But that's been yeah. a real shift from yeah. over, the, over the last 10 years and all of the headlines, you know, 10 yeah. years ago. And yeah. I'm just so curious how you on a very personal level yeah. have felt about whatever that journey has felt like. Well, I'm the same guy, okay? I haven't changed, okay? It's just so, I just think it's so interesting how uh, ten years ago, you know, obviously tons of articles that were highly negative of me and my firm. And then the New York Times writes an article, like a, year, a glowing article. I'm the same guy, okay? And it just shows you that, you know, the world keeps turning. And, you know, just, you know, enjoy your life. And, you know, it's just amazing what can happen. Um, I do want to talk about uh, investing and uh, where, you, where you are. I know you can't talk about individual names, but... Yeah. Yeah. Put it in baseball terms, given that's, your, that's your, your other business now. What inning are we in? Are we in some kind of bubble in terms of where the equity markets are? I don't see it as a bubble. I mean, I think the markets are discounting some of what uh, we, you know, they think AI is going to do for companies. You think it's discounting? Discounting. So I, you think that yeah. there's even more upside I as do. a result of AI? I, I, you know, my view is this is a really durable theme. I'll, get, I'll give you one little anecdote. Uh, my, my, my CTO comes to me and says, I can save the firm $25 million by, uh, you know, doing, you know, using these LLMs to uh, improve our efficiency. Now, we're, we're a nice sized firm. We're not a huge firm. So imagine what big companies can do. And that's just one thing. Okay. So it gives you, a, a, you know, a, a little bit of a look into what's right. possible. And so, you know, people, there, are, there is a view. Yeah. Is this... Yeah. Uh, is the AI boom, uh, what does that mean for chips? Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? You know, who are, yeah. So when you look at that, who do yeah. you think the winners and losers are? Well, listen, I'm not going to talk about individual right. stocks, okay? But there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be big winners and big losers, okay? Because this is transformational. And, and um, so, you know, you got to do the work and figure out, you know, wh wh what companies are going to benefit. And frankly, it's going to be companies that you haven't even heard of. There'll be new right. companies. I mean, when you have technological change like this, you know, it sort of reminds me of the 90s, where you know, the, be the best new companies came out of that period. But does then yeah. that mean we're in 1996? Does that we're, mean we're in 1999? You know, we're not in 99, okay? I mean, I don't think so. And so because I think it's a durable theme, I think... Now, it, it doesn't mean it goes up in a straight line, right? I mean, um, it, it, it may take a while for this AI theme, you know, actually to really take hold within companies and they're trying to figure out how to use it. 
Right. And so, but when you, but it, it, this is so, it's, it has the potential to change how my firm operates. If, if you're a company and you're not thinking about this, right. you're, you, you know, you're gonna wake up one day and go, we're in trouble. What do you think about where the Fed is today? Yeah. Are you expecting uh, cuts to come this year at all anymore? I mean, how, how yeah. do you think about what the yeah. Fed's doing and how much that's propelling the market one way or the other? Yeah, you know, I think the market expects three cuts. I think that's the number. I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I, you know, I think inflation's been, you know, somewhat contained. And I think, I mean, ultimately, what it'll come down to is that a true statement or not. Uh, it, you know, we think, the Fed thinks they, you know, eventually is going to come down to 2% right. inflation rate. What do you think? I think that's going to be hard. Okay. So what, is that 3% and, 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 for you? I, I don't, you know, I, I don't get in the weeds quite like that as a two and a half. I mean, that, those are Fed watchers. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, there's still a lot of underemployment in, in, in the country. And so it really comes down to if growth is too fast, then, you know, you start getting constraints on, on labor and wages go up and that may be a problem for right. but, but it's hard to, it, we're in one of these periods where I don't think many people know exactly right. what's going to happen. Um, we keep talking on the broadcast about whether we're in this sort of risk on, risk off right. situation. We look at the Magnificent Seven. Uh, we look at the NASDAQ. On the flip side, we keep looking at Bitcoin. I don't know, do you own, do you own any Bitcoin? I, actually, uh, I own very little. I own, own a little bit. But you own a little bit? Yeah, like really little. little for what reason? Like, no, the only reason my son is really into it. And right. so he's, he had me like play around and try to figure out how to like, um, you know, transact on Coinbase. So I, okay. bought, I bought a little bit. Do you, have a, do you have a take on what's going on with Bitcoin or if it rep what it really represents? Yeah. I don't follow it that closely. It's not kind of what I do. I mean, you know, there, there's certainly an element of the population that believes in it. And uh, it, maybe it's the new gold. Hard to know, right? So, um, so I, I don't have a strong opinion on right. it. The, the reason I ask you about Bitcoin, though, is to the extent that some people think that's a hedge against, right. you know, uh, inflation on, on one side. Well, that's the same thing as gold, right? Well, that's the question. Or, or, is it, or, right? Well, you know, it's, an, it's a new instrument. I mean, that's the argument. Uh, we'll see. I mean, really hard to know. I think ultimately, I mean, Bitcoin's separate from crypto. Right. I mean, but I think ultimately it's about use case. You know, will crypto develop use cases? So, you know, Bitcoin's interesting, but it's not, it's just a piece of that whole ecosystem. And, and then in terms of how you think about, I mean, we were talking earlier about the election. Um, do you think the election's going to have a huge impact on the markets at this point? You know, I think a little bit. You know, obviously, if Trump comes in, you can imagine... Um, you know, perhaps uh, tariffs. I mean, that's certainly possible. Right. Um, you know, he's probably going to be perceived good for growth. Um, but, you know, growth has been fine already. And if, and if he comes in and it's good for growth in a, in a constrained labor, labor environment, you know, right. that may stoke some inflation fears. It's possible. But I don't see that big a difference either way. Is that yeah. in, inside the firm? Is there yeah. a house view about what that, how the election pans out? Well, we think today we probably say Trump has an edge, but it's so early right. that, you know, it could change. I mean, these things are volatile. These things are very volatile. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Steve, we want to thank you for being here. It's been, it was it's good. been great to have good this to conversation. Here. We hope to do this uh, okay. again. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'm available next week. You're available okay. next week. Okay. We'll, we'll hopefully okay. see you next week. Uh, right. Steve Cohen, thank you so All much right. for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, good luck with the season. And, um, We'll see where things go. And good luck with your golf this afternoon. And hopefully yeah. the, the weather will uh, right. cooperate. That is Squawk Pod for today. Thanks for listening. And an announcement for you. We have been nominated for a Webby Award for our special podcast series featuring Becky Quick's last interview with longtime Berkshire Hathaway Vice Chairman Charlie Munger. Is there anything left on your bucket list? Anything you'd like to do? Well, that's an interesting question. I am so old and weak compared to what I was when I was 96. And you can help. Show your support for us at vote.webbyawards.com. That's vote.webbyawards.com. We'll include the exact link to our category in today's show notes. Now, you can only vote once per category for the very best of the Internet. We'd love to have you in our corner for this year's Webbies. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern and 
follow Squawk Pod wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet you back here tomorrow. We are clear. Thanks, guys.